All right. Um, <clears throat> how many people made New Year's resolutions? Raise your hand. How many people wanted to, but didn't? How many people refused to? How many people didn't even think about it? So I feel like I'm extra lucky because I also celebrate Lunar New Year, which this year will be February 1st. So I get two chances. But to be perfectly honest, I, I don't generally make <clears throat> New Year resolution, mainly because I think, oh, if there's something I think about changing, then I should just do it. And this is a time to for many of us to if not do it to think about it so i thought that talking about renunciation is a good topic and look it just dropped to all the participants just left no i'm just kidding right as many of you might hear renunciation and then just go no fucking way like i'm out of here i renounce this right now and just go so for for many of us, when we hear renunciation, um, we think of it as having to give up something. And in fact, the American English or the English American English Dictionary, um, the synonyms for renunciation is abandonment, repudiation, denial, disavow. Right? Really very much towards a sense of deprivation and self-denial. So as a negative or a loss right, of something. However, in Buddhism, um, renunciation is very much part of the practice of freedom, of liberation. Just like Donna actually is a form of renunciation for sure, except for the Buddha had taught, you know, had many lists. You hear in Buddhism, there are many lists. And the Donna, and then ethical conduct is the second one. Donna starts many, many lists. The six paramitas, the six qualities that is of an enlightened person, uh, and Theravon, there are 10. Uh, the three things that lay people should do, Donna begins, the 10 qualities of a ruler begins with Donna. So Donna, the Buddha often taught at the beginning because it is thought of as a easeful quality. And if you think about it, the, the, the sense of wanting to give is a open one. Like, and I, I, I've talked about this before, I think here, or at BMC anyways, is even as I'm talking about giving, my hand goes like this, right? You don't hear people going, giving, well, maybe you do, but you know, give to me kind of thing. But in general, when you think about Donna or giving, there's a sense of opening up, right? So, Gil Fronstall talks about how we can think of freedom in two ways freedom to and freedom from and in the capitalist society in the united states we focus on freedom to i should have the freedom to buy whatever i want do whatever i want you know i should have the freedom to you know drink whatever coffee i want and um our sense is that we don't want to be restricted or impeded. So that it is very much from a sense of um, that I should have the right to. Whereas in Buddhism, our focus is much more on freedom from. And really it's freedom from the urge, right? Free freedom from the obsessive quality, right? Not, so, not like a freedom to be obsessive, right? Because what is the second noble truth? What's the cause of suffering? Not desire, folks. Thank goodness. Not desire, 
So what you want is not a problem. It's the obsessiveness, the energy of that. Just like if, you know, the difference between, you know, like, I don't know, I like somebody, but then when you are obsessive about them, then it becomes more likely to be suffering. And so this is why, and in particular, we often the talk about renunciation is talked about in terms of renouncing um, physical things, and in particular, what's called the six senses. So in Buddhism, there are six senses, right? The first five we are very familiar with, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Body here means tactile. So there's six. So these are, five of them are very much sensual, right? Things that come through your eyes, your ears, your body, taste, isn't that true? So, so this is why having a sense of renouncing those because they will bring um, thoughts that are, they can bring thoughts and they often bring thoughts that are can be suffering making, or if it's not suffering making, it's in the sense of, in terms of meditative practice, they take you away from your goal. And just like at the beginning, when we meditated, many of you probably closed your eyes. You think that's the just a instruction of meditation, but that's to close your eye contact so that you don't get caught in content. Right. If we were in at EBMC, you know, often I, um, I talk about how you know if you have your eyes open, then you know you could see somebody's socks and you go, oh, those are nice socks. Where did they get them? I wonder how much they cost. Afterward, I'm going to ask them. Or you see somebody that you like, and so instead of focusing on your breath, you just keep making up story. Right? Um, many years ago at, um, Frameline, I saw a short film, right? Where this lesbian, right? Goes into a store and she has her basket and, um, she's at the checkout line and then she looks over and sees somebody and she likes her. So then all of a sudden, you know, like they're talking, you know, they go out to dinner with wine and candlelight, and then they get married, and then they have an apartment, and then poof, they show you that she's still standing in the line at the checkout counter, right? So that's why, right? You go off and have fantasies, you know, which it's fine when you're standing in the line, but if you're concentrating on you know, being aware of your breath so that you can get the subtleness to examine, you know, whatever you're examining, your, your thoughts and whatever, then it's impeding your um, goal. Or if your goal is to work, right, if you have a project to finish, often we close the door or we do something so that we can stay focused. So that's very much about like the sense stuff. All right. So, you know, if renunciation sounds too like oh, harsh and too much, then a, a useful word I think is to relinquish. So instead, renunciation might sound too, too much like I have to completely let go. So maybe it's about relinquishing. By the way, letting go is a renunciation word. And we do hear about it a lot in Buddhism. So the, the, point on a certain level of practice is to learn to let go. Right? To let go of what causes us suffering. So sense stores themselves are not a problem, but when they impede your goal or your, by goal it doesn't mean just, um, you know, keeping concentrated, but let's say I'm in a committed relationship, you know, and it's not an open one if I'm you know, 
thinking about somebody and then acting on it, then that's not useful to my relationship, is it? Hmm? All right. Today, I also want to talk about then, not just so much about, you know, the, the sense doors. It's very much um, relinquishing of thoughts and not so much on things and behavior. We examine our minds, right? That's called Vipassana, right? And the patterns of thoughts. Note, I am not saying we stop our thoughts. It is possible to stop your thoughts, but it's very, very difficult. And so um, the mind function is to secrete thoughts. I used to say Kataguri Roshi said that, but I guess he didn't. I made that up somewhere along the line. But some Zen master, I think, said the function of the mind is to secrete thoughts. So we're not really practicing to cut off our thoughts. We're really trying to notice the process because in noticing the process and with concentration, then um, it tends to kind of give a space around it. And when you examine your thoughts, who here has been on a one day retreat at the minimum or a many day retreat, right? Part of what part of what's difficult about practice is that when you sit down and you're quiet and you observe your thoughts, oh my goodness, aren't there just so many thoughts? One time, you know, I was at uh, practicing at the monastery of Tassajara in a practice period, which is 90 days. And then, then we face the wall. And in a practice period, you're assigned a seat. Right? And, and uh, if you haven't been in a Zendo, uh, Soto Zen meditation hall, the tan or the, the raised platform are all the way around the sides, right? And you face the wall. And I was in a corner, so I only had one person on my left and I and she was from Italy this priest and I realized one point that I was having thoughts in Italian I don't know Italian so I don't you know these are like just like thoughts that are not really useful thoughts so so many of the things that go on in our thoughts are not Thoughts with real meaning or substance, right? Charlotte Joko Beck says that 90% of our thoughts are discursive thoughts. In Buddhism, discursive thought means thoughts that are just kind of on a loop and they don't not necessarily relate to what's going on. So on one level, we're working to see how our, the mind function is to secrete thought, but we're also by the way, we're also practicing to direct our thoughts. This is why meditation is often called mind training. So we're not just going, um, I'm here and I'm just going to be open to every thoughts because we have unwholesome, that's classic wording, right? But we have, we have thoughts that are not useful to our lives that support the values of our lives or to support our purpose of our life, be it in the moment or the larger purpose. So we need to really notice the quality of our thoughts, the content, you know, it's less important the more and more you practice than noticing the quality of your thought, because mostly the content is like a soap opera, right? Pretty much the same content, just the characters have changed. And pretty much similarly, when you pay attention, the, the storyline is pretty much the same. So then you start to say, well, where is the storyline that I do want to have purpose? This is how you have a life of purpose. We, we often think a life of purpose means I have something out there that gives me purpose. In practice, a life of purpose is you live purposefully. You think purposefully, you emote purposefully, you behave purposefully. So the how do we do that? And we do that by watching the patterns and then seeing 
which ones support our goal and our intention and if they don't how do we work with them to um, be so not as a control mind you but as an intentional life by the way mindfulness one of the meanings of mindfulness is like to be a manager that directs and engages oh is this in towards my purpose or not just like mindfulness when your meditation is the quality that says okay it's only the first five minutes of meditation so i'm still working on concentration i need to come back in the way all the instruction i gave you was to the qual the ways to be mindful how to manage your awareness so that you can build concentration Now, a lot of what we do is we're practicing to see what habitual or thoughts are extra right, that aren't really um, needed. And in paying attention to them, they bring suffering. That's why I mean when it's not needed. For instance, so um, I was at Hoshinji, which is where I practice in Japan. It's a monastery that in the mid-2000 was 500 years old. And so um, we would clean, you know, have you seen those, those videos of the monks running with the cloth? Have you seen those people? Yep. So we do those for sure. That we do that every other day. Hmm? And we swept every day and we weeded every day. One time, we were cleaning the outside of the monastery, which is, again, I'll remind you, a 500-year-old monastery. And a lot of the outside was wood. A 500-year-old monastery that's of wood. So the outside planks of wood are what? Rough rough hmm? so now you see if you've seen those videos there they're, they're called kenton they're like a white towel that's very thick right kind of like a diaper cloth diaper but you know kind of that kind of thick so those are the the cloth that they use for cleaning now if you can imagine cleaning the outside wood with these cloths that are made of cotton what happens lots of little white bits over right so we were just cleaning and cleaning and of course in a zen monast temple monastery there's a work leader and you do what they tell you you don't question things that's a lot of practice in buddha in zen is that um you you just do what you're told right and part of it has to do with then you get to watch what comes up the tighter the container, this is partly why renunciation gives you a tight container to see what happens when you push against it. And so as we were cleaning, I kept thinking, we are leaving little bits of white stuff on the wall. How is this useful? How is this cleaning? Right? Ah, ah, I would never do it like this. I've been a work leader. Yeah, I know what, you know, this is just useless right how does this temple last for 500 years right right and then i thought as i was you know pushing along does it matter my thoughts no because one nobody asks my opinion two this is how they've done it for 500 years <laughs> right like should I come in and tell them how it should be done? Talk about, you know, like American centerism, you could say, or just, you know, bossy person centerism, right? So then I thought, wow, that is all extra. I was suffering. I was like, right? I was not happy. I was not carefree cleaning. I was not just cleaning. I was agitated over just 
pushing a cloth if you, you know this is also why when you when you open up a bigger picture part of renunciation is to renounce what what did i just say was the cause of suffering obsessiveness it's okay to have the thought wow how is this useful i don't know but to then to then to take it to the story and the obsessiveness of how you know all those things that's where you could go oh this is a, a, a suffering that's unnecessary i wasn't suffering at all to be perfectly i mean you know the doing of it there was no suffering there it wasn't like it was hard work my opinion and the obsessiveness of my opinion was the suffering does that make sense what i'm trying to share here and this is where we're practicing to see where we can not only alleviate suffering but end suffering more and more i've been thinking you know i used to think ending suffering that's so hard mm, ending suffering but then i realized that's an ending of a suffering right there right to be able to let go of in this case an opinion and a obsessiveness of thought another way to work with that is sometimes you know and it's really great on the cushion or chair, your meditative posture, is to label everything that comes up as fantasy. I did that once for two periods at the monastery. And I tell you, I was so happy at the end. Like, I was just light. Because when everything is just, just a fantasy, then you don't need to get involved. The obsessive quality I'm a very obsessive person, right? Most of us are. Mm -hmm. So it's a relief, right? Renunciation gives us relief. This is the aim of renunciation. We're not saying you should renounce everything, right? We're saying, where is it that renunciation ends your suffering? And we practice doing it so that we can renounce when it's useful, when we need to. So what if we thought of renunciation or relinquishment as focusing not on what is lost, but on what is gained? And letting go, we gain, not lose. Certainly, it takes effort to renounce. Even in the meditation, I asked you to renounce. I didn't say, okay, now renounce listening. Now renounce going off on your memory. But that's essentially what? Renouncing can be harder, so sometimes coming back to your aim is a way of supporting your renunciation. Um, in Pali, the word for renunciation is akema, and the etymology of it means to go out or to go forth. And the commentary for it is about like if you were in a cabin for many days and you had cabin fever, and then you go outside. Right. So this is the kind of going forth in the outside. So. We renounce when we feel closed in. So whenever you're feeling closed in, whenever you have a sense of suffering, you could ask yourself, oh, what is it that needs to be renounced here? Is it a thought? Is it, is it a essential thing, perhaps? Is it a thought? Is it a sense of self? Right? I mean, some of my about the cleaning the wall is, you know, I know how to clean things, even though, you know, I'd only been at the monast a 500 year old monastery for, I don't know, a month at a time at that time or something weeks. So we can think then of renunciation as letting go into well being. So of course, you know, shaving your head 
is a kind of renunciation. It's a renunciation of our attachment to our sense of self, right? Of what we It's a practice of not being attached to how we think we should look. And it's actually um, a renunciation into joy, I said, because the less you have to worry about, you know, I, I do not, you know, in my tradition, I don't have to actually keep my head shaved anymore. But I do it because, oh my God, I have saved so many hours right in the morning of fixing the hair. And I have a real cowlick here, right? So many hours of dealing with my hair and thinking if I look X, Y, or Z well enough. In Thailand, when I practice in Thailand, they shave their eyebrows too. And I did it when I was there and gosh, it was very interesting. It was like another level of letting go of my sense of myself. You think you think these two little eyebrows don't mean that much? It's, I, they weren't for me until they were gone. I mean, I didn't suffer, but it was this uh, other sense of like, wow, something feels both more missing, lacking. And then at the same time, I also felt cleaner. It wasn't like my face was any dirtier, but it was like, to me, that's a that's kind of that sense of, oh, less to worry about. Mm -hmm. So that's what renunciation can also be. So certainly, right, when we are free from discursive thoughts and bring awareness, right, then we are free to go towards the joy of an intentional life, right? of a purposeful life. Right, that's what I have to say about it. Uh, let's go into breakout rooms. I'm gonna suggest that your topic will be, what have you given up that has been a gain? Instead of a loss, it's a gain.